Good afternoon, and I'm so glad you want to spend your afternoon with us here at Real Wealth. I'm Kathy Fetke, co-CEO and co-founder of Real Wealth. And it takes a lot of uh, guts, I guess, to try to make any sense of, of uh, the housing market these days, but I'm gonna do my best here and uh, just kind of share what we're seeing and what we're planning for uh, for the rest of 2020 and for next year. So again, thank you so much for signing up. Thank you for being here. Uh, I was adjusting this new big screen that I have that my husband bought one of those massive screens where you could put a bunch of things on and, and that just kind of changed up how things look here. So <laughs> thanks for waiting. We'll get started in just a few minutes. Uh, I hope everyone's having a, a really wonderful day and enjoying this very warm weather. If you're in California, it's been it's, uh, maybe other places too, but hopefully we get rain early this year. I was lucky enough to be in Seattle when it rained and, and slowed down those fires. So, okay, I think people are still joining, but we'll go ahead and get started. So again, welcome to uh, welcome to my 2020 mid-year housing update. I'm Kathy Fedke, co-CEO and co-founder of Real Wealth, and I am going to be just giving an update on a snapshot, basically, of where the housing market is today uh, and why. <laughs> That's the big question: is why. I think people are very, a lot of people are very surprised at the headlines. So I think I can give a little background on on. Uh, what's going on so my disclaimer is usually a lot longer than this but i'm just going to say it's 2020 y'all i have no idea what's coming next <laughs> none of us do it just seems to change every month and we we have a few more months to go of this so i'm looking forward to 2021 but i do hope that you've enjoyed your quarantine and have it you know been able to make maybe learn something new maybe do a little more studying maybe even invest in more property when you've got more time to do it uh, all right, so I want to kind of go back to January, and if you were listening to any of my forecasts back then, I do a, a housing predictions every January based on the data that we're seeing and, uh, you know, based on what we're doing at Real Wealth and putting it all together to make plans for the year. So in January, um, most people were saying, let's party like it's 1920, <laughs> because there were so many headlines about how great the economy was and low unemployment and so much new job creation and the Dow Jones was, you know, off the charts. And uh, so there was just a lot of belief that the economy was strong. But you probably know if you've listened to me and listened to my forecasts, it there was something, there were cracks in the foundation for sure. Uh, and we started to see those cracks in September when there was already QE happening, but very quietly, very secretly, the Fed was um, printing more money. And that's usually something you only do during a downturn to stimulate the economy. So uh, there were just some question marks there. So I did not feel like uh, you should party like it's 1920 unless you know what happened <laughs> 19, uh, at the end of that decade. So my predictions in January were kind of like this, just a big question mark. like. Don't take anything for granted because something always triggers the next recession and it usually happens when things are great, when people are really confident and spending more money and taking out loans and buying houses and getting new jobs and all these things. When you look at the charts, when it gets to that frenzied state, something comes along. And uh, so I said, you know, there's probably a black swan event that we cannot see at this time. And this was in January. Oddly enough, we kind of already knew about the pandemic, but didn't, I, I don't know, we, we've never experienced it. So we didn't know what to think about that or think that it might hit us here in the US. So I did not see that as the, the black swan until uh, I was flying in February and every, you know, people were starting to wear masks and I started to pay attention at that point. And of course, you know, everything happened after that. But because I had a sense that we were in that euphoric state of the economy back in January when people start to get too aggressive, too confident, aren't calculating, 
um, or, or not, not preparing in any way for the possibility of a downturn because they can't see one coming, even though in every single past recession, most people couldn't see it coming <laughs> So and weren't preparing for it and kind of got taken off guard. So I was just a little wary anyway. And, and for a lot of deals I was seeing, so many that were coming across our desk at, at Real Wealth, they just didn't pencil out that, that well. Now, I learned a lot of this the hard way because Rich and I took really hard hits in 2009 because of that very thing, because I was so aggressive. Uh, I didn't calculate the possibility of a downturn back then and we got hurt from it. So, um, you know, boy, you don't wanna go through that twice. So we were being very cautious. Um, I was on a lot of stages over the last couple of years telling people, I know you're excited about buying multifamily. You've seen people making millions of dollars on their multifamily. Um, sorry, I'm just going to check that to see if there's something wrong. Nope, everything's okay. Um, so what we were seeing is that on multifamily deals, people were only supposing and in their underwriting considering that rents would continue to rise. And that's how they were uh, evaluating the properties they were buying. They thought, well, we'll buy it at these peak prices, but we're gonna raise rents and we're gonna you know, increase the value. And I would come and say, well, you don't know for sure that rents will continue to go up because at some point there's affordability issues there and people can't afford higher rents. So don't assume it. You should always be underwriting for the possibility that rents could go down. So this was the message I've been saying for years. And I've been telling people this doesn't by any means mean not to invest. In fact, we were, Rich and I were actively investing over the last few years. We were just being very careful about it. And a lot of it was based on this slide that I've shown many times by John Burns Real Estate Consulting. John Burns has been on the Real Well Show podcast several times, and he's just somebody I've followed for 15 years uh, because he offers so much great data and information, and you can even get uh, more data and, and information if you hire his consulting firm, but he gives a lot of it for free if you just go there and, and sign up for his new newsletter. So I've been following him and taking advantage of his advice for a long time. And this was a slide that he had shown years ago based on his demographic research, research that household growth was going to be increasing, in the, and this is in the millions here, uh, between 2016 and 2025 in a big way that there's gonna be this huge demographic shift. and the shift mainly to the Southeast. Now, why? Well, jobs and affordability and good weather uh, for sure. And and again, demographics, you've got uh, baby boomers really wanting to retire and maybe realizing, huh, I, I've made so much equity over the last 10 years in my home. Maybe I could sell it, cash in that equity and go somewhere else that's cheaper, that still has a nice uh, way of life, you know, uh, you know, all those, parts of the country in red, they're, they're lovely places to live. So, you know, if you can sell your house and, and you know, buy another house somewhere else and pay all cash and have no debt and retire with lower state income taxes, that's what people are gonna do. So that trend was already in place. Also, you'll see Texas on there and Florida. These three areas where millions of people were already migrating to, and, and yet the affordability is insane. I mean, we're, we were helping investors, as you know, at Real Wealth buy properties for under 100,000. Well, in these areas, it was you know between 100 and 150,000, but um, over the past few years, like just three or four years ago, we were still getting properties under 100,000 with all this dynamics in place. So even if rents did go down, we knew that, we'd be okay uh, because when you've got enough people that can afford what you have to offer, you're probably gonna be okay. Um, and that's what we were counting on and a, a huge diversification of employer base in those areas as well. And finally, just uh, one of the reasons we love those areas is they're landlord friendly. Uh, they, they, they're, these are areas where they have very strong property rights that if, if you're a tenant and you don't pay your rent, you, you literally just don't get to live there. Um, that's, that's the way it works in, in a lot of these uh, southeastern states. So for many reasons, we felt that whether things went up or down um, in the coming years, we'd be okay. And I have some slides a little bit later to kind of show how Rich and I rode through the last recession, like some of the good choices we made versus the, the bad ones. Because <laughs> we made a lot of really good choices then too. Problem is when you have a leak in the foundation, it can, it, could, it can really take the whole thing down. 
I didn't want that for any for anyone. So here we go. We're just now since January, since my predictions when I said some kind of black swan event might come and change everything overnight, boy, did I not expect this one. But here we are uh, nine months into it. And here's how I'm going to summarize it in a nutshell. <laughs> um, and this just to me, what this means besides a lot of things is that a lot of people weren't prepared. A lot of people weren't prepared and we were freaking out about things like toilet paper. <laughs> so I hope what a lot of people have learned is is what uh, many people have already you know learned. I know Mormons for sure have a policy about having a, a year stocked of supplies. Uh, now I think more and more people are realizing there's a reason for that. There's a good reason for that. Stock up. And uh, and then we also learned scarcity kind of can make people crazy because we saw some people uh, stocking up too much and not sharing with others. And that's another reason to stock up now. Just get a little bit each time you go shopping, a little bit more. Uh, stock up on your savings. A lot of we found out, we learned quickly that many people didn't have savings and weren't able to get through just one month of unemployment. Uh, so we, we, we learned, boy, it's more important to save, isn't it, to at least have a few months savings, but better than that, how about six months? How about a year? Wouldn't that have made things easier? So hopefully more and more people have learned this. But there's other reasons why I think for me, this is the theme for 2020. And this slide literally <laughs> shows it. This is, you can track it now in San Francisco. Human feces uh, incidents, uh, public incidents in San Francisco has gone up, gone up dramatically over the years. Um, here's a few and I think it actually really accelerated this year. Um, 2020, here's another highlight. This paddleboard guy gets arrested. Yeah, I mean, you know, he looks like he's social distancing, doesn't look like he's disturbing the peace, but um, this is just an example of panic. Arrest the surfer. Look at him being hauled off for surfing. Um, then, of course, we have the riots. And here in Santa Monica, here's one that just stands out to me. <laughs> it does not look like. Um, what the protest was really about, which was, again, police brutality and fairness for uh, our black Americans. And um, instead, we see a lot of surfers just taking some surfboards for free. Um, what they didn't realize uh, that, you know, maybe these protests weren't about looting. They were about something else uh, very important. And uh, there's cameras in these stores. So many of these people who thought they were getting a free surfboard were arrested. Lots of people were arrested for that. Um, businesses closed. So here you had businesses closing for COVID. You had businesses closing for uh, after the riots. In fact, I have so many friends who have restaurants in, in Santa Monica who finally, the day they were able to open, the riots came and closed them. So really tough time, really, really tough time for, for uh, restaurant owners, for sure, especially the smaller ones. And that, of course, affects employees who work for those companies. Uh, we know that a large portion of jobs are created by small business and small business got just hit so hard during this time. And, you know, you all remember this headline of 30 million Americans losing their job in just a matter of six weeks. I mean, talk about an event we really, most of us could not have seen coming. Businesses closing, 30 million people losing their jobs. Uh, and that, another thing, you know, this Dallas salon owner jailed for reopening. Um, boy, I'm glad a lot of this is behind us. Uh, eviction moratoriums, that was really scary for, uh, you know, for landlords. But at the same time, people are losing their jobs. They couldn't pay the rent. What were they going to do? Go out on the street? We already saw <laughs> pictures before. We don't, we don't want that. So eviction moratorium, but what were landlords supposed to do when they had expenses to pay? These were all questions that we had just never dealt with. Um, and of course, people marching the streets saying, how can we pay our rent if uh, if we're not working and we're not allowed to work? Uh, so, of course, the eviction moratorium. And yet at the same time, when a salon owner can't wear a mask and work on her, um, you know, cut someone's hair, I don't, I can have my hair cut in 10 minutes. Um, you know, we protests were okay. They were not illegal. So again, just so many question marks and confusion and 2020 is a time where we just go, wow, there was a lot of panic and a lot of laws that were made that um, didn't necessarily make sense. Uh, I was all for the protests. I'm, I'm all for, for equality and fairness, and um, but but to, sh to not allow a salon owner with a mask, and you know, I just, it didn't make sense. 
someone to get arrested. Again, I might be upsetting some people and I apologize. I uh, seems these days there's a lot of sensitivity out there. And if I've offended you, I really I, I apologize. I just want to this this has been some of the highlights for me. And we're going to get to how it affects housing in a minute. This is a big one. Um, this is the first time, at least in my experience in the in the real estate world, that the Center for Disease Control and Prevention could make uh, could enter into housing law and extend the eviction moratorium. Again, all for a great cause, right? A great cause. Don't put people out on the streets when they are they literally lost their jobs and can't get a new one, didn't have the choice. There were laws saying they couldn't work, uh, so it makes sense that they shouldn't be evicted. But what about the landlord, the landlord who's got bills to pay? Uh, what's what do they get? So again, lots of fast-moving laws that you know there wasn't time to think through, and that certainly affected our industry. Um, and then of course there's this. So I'm not going to get into that, but this I'm just looking for it forward to it all being over because um, I think we're going to have more turmoil over the next few months uh, during this election year. There's always turmoil during election years uh, this year, uh, for sure. So how does all of this affect housing for the rest of the year and into next? Will we see a deeper recession as a result of all these job losses? Will will the president not, not whoever gets elected, become president? I mean, there's so many questions we have. We're still very much living in the unknown. So how do you move forward? Do we have a second wave coming? Um, again, we, we don't, we just don't know what's ahead of us and we, but we still need to make decisions of what to do with our investments and our, and our money. Do we sell? Do we buy? Do we buy gold? Do we take our money out of the bank and hold on to cash? You know, what are, what are, do we get into the Dow? Is it going to continue to rise? <laughs> Is it at the peak? Well, here's the things that we do know. In a time when there's so much uncertainty, uh, we've got to be able to read the signs of what what we think might happen. And and one of the signs that, as you know, if you've watched any of my predictions, is watching what the Federal Reserve does. The Federal Reserve is the central banking system of the U.S. And uh, basically, it's it's the banking system. It's private. It's not federal. It's it's a private banking system that when when the Federal Reserve raises rates, it tends to slow down the economy. And when the Federal Reserve lowers rates, the overnight lending rate, it tends to stimulate the economy. And this is the way the Federal Reserve banking system has, you know, basically tried to monitor the economy. Well, in March, when there was, you know, suddenly all these businesses shut down, that is when on March 23rd that the Fed announced unlimited quantitative easing, unlimited printing of money. That's what that means. Just a fancy way of saying it. Um, this was a game changer and this has never been done. Unlimited. That's a lot. <laughs> um, and the interesting thing is it much of this money went towards our industry. It went towards keeping the banks lending. And what we know from past recessions, now the 2008 recession is one that's most fresh and that most people remember acutely, but it's not the norm. Normally, housing is not as affected during recessions, and uh, but the last housing, that the last recession was caused by housing, so of course it was the main reason. Uh, but it was also housing is what brought us out of the recession. So this time, what we're seeing is is kind of the same housing that the Federal Reserve investing unlimited amounts of money to have housing lead us out of the economy. So it's really a good business to be in if you've done it right, if you've prepared properly for this, for, for sort of the unknown. 